I've got this pain right in my... I'm sorry. The doctor doesn't treat that. What about three weeks from Tuesday? No, no, the doctor doesn't usually make house calls. <laughs> down, please. Name, please. Address. Insurance. Medicare. It hurts about here, Doc. Sign here, please. X-ray, four miles west. AKG, that's across town. Right turn at first, left turn at second. Behind the drop over the port stand. You can't miss it. In order to get all the tests we'll need, I'll want you to check in at the hospital for a few days. A bed? We have a long waiting list. How about uh, three weeks from Friday? Consumer now goes for health services. He takes what's offered. He can't afford to shop like he would for a car or anything else. He don't know whether he's getting quality service, mediocre service, or poor service. He just knows he's getting what the doctor's giving. My wife having a baby, $1,500. That's a killing me. I went in there at, on Monday morning and came home Saturday when my bill was $723.50. Plus, my doctor bill was $225. Health care prices are going up at about twice the rate of the general consumer price index in this country, and that's a very serious problem. It's the fear of a lingering illness, and the way the old people are treated, that's what gets me. Well, I'm fortunate. I, don't ha I have not had a lot of sickness. <laughs> Where am I? You think we're getting it? I think we've got a long way to go. Hey, let me out of here. Hand me another hospital. Jack, you hear anything? No. How about that figure of $70 billion? What do we do with that? Save it. Use it later. How about adding a 70-bed wing to this hospital? Resources survey would indicate negative. An extended care facility might be better. One ECF at point X. We really need an area-wide planning agency here. How about it? Check. How about telling me where I am? The think tank. You're a feedback resource, right? Huh? You probably made a complaint and ended up in someone's file, right? Well, I, uh... So, don't just stand there. Do your thing. If the med school at point Y can't supply the physician's assistant, we might consider a nurse coordinator from over here. Might work. Let's try it. Hey, with all these hospitals and doctors and medical schools and stuff, how come the whole setup doesn't work the way it should? Well, there are a lot of reasons. We don't get the medical care we need. We don't get it when we need it. We can't get the doctors when we need to get to them. Oftentimes, we can't pay for it when we get there. There is an imbalance between provision of medical care and what the medical consumer needs. The consumer has little or no voice. The medical system is not a system. Well, one of the problems that accounts for many difficulties that people personally experience now, I think, in obtaining adequate health services is that the present health care delivery system has grown in a very disorganized, a very fragmented way. The patient must find his way through a maze of services, frequently with no single coordination point that can help him decide whether he needs the care of a super specialist or the care of a, of a nurse, for example, or a social worker. We are talking about a system that came into its present existence, its present form, without much 
careful, systematic, overall planning. In 1966, Congress passed the Comprehensive Health Planning legislation. This law provides for health planning at the state level, health planning at the regional or area-wide level, provides for training of health planners. It provided for a block grant to states, which would provide money to the states, which could be put into any health activity based on the state's idea of, of what its priorities needs were. It was also the intent of Congress to provide a mechanism for hearing the previously unheard, the man in the street, the poor, the elderly, to give them a voice in the design of services that are there to meet their needs. Surveys, studies, charts, statistics, what is all this stuff? Research data, the opinions and ideas of experts. Yeah, if you really want to know what's wrong with medical care, just ask ordinary people. Consumer research? Ah, call it what you want. Yes, but what do people really know about health care? They know where it hurts. Watch. We've got doctors, hospitals, x-ray labs, pharmacies, more doctors, specialists for the head, the bones, the nerves, the skin, the stomach, the eyes, the teeth, etc., etc., etc. So what happens when you get sick? You get stretched, all, all out of shape. And so does your wallet. Fragmentation of services. Over-specialization. You've got big words for everything. You, you know what's wrong with you? You just don't know what it's like out there. Oh, is that so? We get sick too, you know. It is one thing to be sick. It is quite another thing to be sick and poor. Government-funded neighborhood health centers, such as the Matthew Walker Center in Nashville, Tennessee, and the Park Hill Center in Denver, Colorado, are seeking to bring quality health care within the reach of the nation's poor. Whether it's located in a shopping center or in the heart of a housing project, the idea of a neighborhood health center is to be where the people are. This is the Columbia Point housing project in Boston. And this is Ann Stokes, a mother of 10 children who still finds time to be actively involved in the health care problems of the poor. Mrs. Stokes is director of the Columbia Point Health Association a community advisory group working with the center, a one-time welfare recipient, she knows that the word health takes in a lot of territory. Health is a small word, but it covers many areas. I can't very well talk to a boy who's sniffing glue in the hallway, and he tells me he has nothing to do, and I just accept that and go back home. Because the only way I can get him from start sniffing glue is to have something else for him to do. I can't tell senior citizens, someone will take care of you while you go to the store. Your handbag won't be snatched. I gotta find out, before she's even beaten up and brought into the health center, I gotta find out where the policemen are. And I mean, to me, this is health. It's all a part of health, getting the job done. Getting the job done at Columbia Point means providing a wide range of medical services for more than a thousand families living in the vast project. The center occupies three floors of a converted apartment house. The centers are located in urban and rural communities where in the past comprehensive health care was not only inaccessible, but frequently unavailable. In well-appointed and dignified settings, professionalism combines with neighborly warmth and visions conjured up by what is traditionally associated with clinic care vanish amid spotless, cheerful surroundings. Family health care teams, composed of internists, pediatricians, social workers, and community aides, concentrate on the total context of health problems. In the mental health section, men and women from the community are being trained as psychiatric aides. A boy with problems in school is being tested. The aide also provides a father image. In Columbia Point, there aren't enough fathers to go around. Columbia Point, like every center, has an advisory council. Community involvement is the heart of the neighborhood center concept. It's going to come in their mind to us uh, 
will give me the names of these families. Right. And right. I swear to God, I will not give them one well, name. I, I don't think they could set up a group thing, you know, like alphabetical order, or like to have group one, group two. And those aides could do an outreach program on their own by going to house to house. They can knock on doors and talk to these people, see if they have problems that they don't want to come in here and talk about. An advisory council is made up of elected representatives from the community who are not health professionals, but community people. They take their jobs seriously, and their insight is what keeps the professionals in touch with the day-to-day -day realities involved in delivering health care to the poor. But I still say the AIDS, they're just wasting their time, and my heart goes out to these mothers out here in Columbia Point. Uh, all but my heart go out right, to but, but what, what I'm, I'm saying, saying AIDS is, aren't wasting their time when you're poor, and you got a lot of kids, there's so many things that are wrong in your family that you just don't want to talk to anybody. That That's doesn't true. mean that doesn't mean that you need help with your kids. That means you're frustrated and you're tired and you're overworked. We'll never get this thing organized. It's just too big and too complicated. Hey, why don't we stop complaining about how bad it is and take a look at some of the good things that are going on? Like what? Like this neighborhood health center approach. There must be other ways. Models. Experiments. Patterns. Positive things. Like group practice. Prepayment. Physician's assistance. Outpatient care and discharge planning and extended care facilities, home health, and nurse coordinators. Beacon Street in Boston, not quite the same neighborhood as Columbia Point, but exciting things are happening here as well. The Harvard Community Health Center, another way of coping with some of the stresses on our overtaxed medical care system. A prepaid, multi-specialty group practice, the first in the nation sponsored by a medical school. The aim is quality health care for the whole community, regardless of income. The method is prepayment, membership paid through monthly premiums like health insurance or through government assistance programs. What are the advantages of such a plan? Director of the center, Robert Biblow, explains. The best way to answer that question is to describe what we have in this facility. What we have here are a variety of specialists who are able to confer and be referred to by the family physicians um, for particular patient problems. Um, the advantage is that they are under one roof. They need not be referred all over the city. Adequate diagnostic facilities here for all patients, whether it be lab, x-ray, electrocardiogram, or whatnot. So patients can avail themselves of the full range of services under one roof. There is also a common medical record that is available to all physicians. They all utilize the same medical record. And all this, again, simply means that people can use this program, use this facility, um, whenever they feel the need, without the fear that they're going to get bombed with large physician bills. Programs like the Harvard Plan are now being called health maintenance organizations. Dr. Robert Lohr defines the term. A health maintenance organization is an integrated system of providing comprehensive health services. It consists of an arrangement by a contractor or an organization of some kind which agrees to provide to an enrolled population of people comprehensive health care on a prepaid basis. That is, you pay in advance. The main meaning of an HMO, its great strength, is that it provides an economic incentive to the providers of health service to keep people healthy. An HMO will make more money, literally, if the people it serves are kept healthy. While group health and HMO programs will relieve much of the pressure on the system, leadership is called for from hospitals as well. The new Denver General Hospital is pointing the way. Its director, Dr. Edward Dreyfus. the main lobby of our new hospital. You see it's a fairly large and busy place. We've tried to set it up so that it would be, appear to be an attractive place for people to come into because it is their hospital. Uh, and also we wanted to think of it as their health center as well. Now when, a, when patients come in, they come directly here to the information desk. 
You'll notice from here they can be directed immediately to any place they need to go. For example, to the elevators, to the emergency entrance over there, to the admissions area over here, and they can even see here that there is a small nursery where they can leave their children when they go to visit the doctor. But you might like to see the admissions area where many people come. Uh, most people come, in fact. All right, fine. Let's take a look at it. You'll see all these windows here designed to make the wait as short as possible. We want this to be a people's hospital and not set up for our convenience. If people are really sick. They don't have to stop here. They go directly to the emergency room. We've put a great deal of our energy into making the ambulatory services the important thing. We're set up to take care of 400,000 visits a year to our ambulatory services. This is the nursery that we spoke about earlier, where well children can come and be cared for while they're waiting for their brothers and sisters or their mothers to see the doctor. I think it's very important. Pretty picture. Would you believe this is the pediatric clinic of a city hospital? No, it is very hard to believe that. It's so beautiful. Yes, we tried to make it that way, to make it attractive, comfortable, a nice place for people to come. This is the waiting room of the pediatric clinic. It's not as busy as many waiting rooms that you may have seen in other clinics. Many of our patients come here by appointment, in fact, the majority. But it's still available for people to drop in, people from the community to come in at any time they want. But you know, we've got eight floors of hospitals above us here for inpatients. And we've also considered, and we think it's every hospital's responsibility to consider early discharge as well to plan for early discharge of patients from the hospital. Early discharge. It means working to reduce the time patients spend in hospital rooms. At Denver's St. Luke's Hospital, public health nurse Florence Fritz helps to plan not only the early discharge of patients, but the type and quality of care they will receive when they leave. We are in the hospital a full day, and we do have the time to answer questions, to review the cases that have been admitted in the past 24 hours, and to become acquainted with the many patients and their needs in the hospital setting. Mrs. Fritz is a nurse coordinator. In addition to her work with the staff, she often counsels with the families of patients concerning the problems involved in continuing care. Such counseling is particularly necessary when care of the elderly is involved. In such cases, Mrs. Fritz will often assist in getting a patient settled in new surroundings, such as this extended care facility, part of a nursing home on the outskirts of the city. Mr. Imjah, these are the orders that Dr. Khan has written for Mrs. Rethmar. Are there orders for physical therapy? Yes, there are physical therapy orders attached, also occupational therapy orders. She is doing very well. Will the uh, therapy continue until I'm able to walk again? Oh, yes. This is why you are in the extended care facility, is for the continuation of the care. That Many patients are well enough to leave hospitals are... long before they are released. The less expensive extended care facility provides for many of them a welcome halfway house on their road to recovery. An extended care facility offers physical therapy, occupational and speech therapy, and continuous skilled nursing care. Patients are visited regularly by their attending physicians. Doctors are also on call when changes occur in their patient's condition. An extended care facility provides more than custodial care. Its goal is the full rehabilitation of the patient. Nurse coordinators are able to perform many non-medical functions, relieving pressure on physicians overburdened by the complexities of modern medical practice. Other kinds of paramedical personnel are now actually assisting doctors in medical work. Assistant doctors? Is that possible? Sure, it's already being done. In some places they're called medics. Split it apart now. And we cut right up the middle here. Can you pull your hand up? How does it feel? Feels fine, yeah. This young man has never been to medical school. But working closely with a supervising physician, he helps provide care in many ways setting broken bones, suturing wounds, assisting in diagnosis and treatment. Six weeks ago, Mike Carraher set Karen's simple fracture.
Today, he removes the cast and is checking the x-rays with Dr. Robert Sherry, his medical preceptor. Mike is a medex, part of a new experimental program in Seattle, Washington. This program and others like it are making use of the valuable paramedical skills of former GI medical corpsmen. There is a new insignia in the world today, MX, Medex. Dr. Sherry tells us about it. All right, Dr. Sherry, what about the, um, the training of the medics? Where do they come from? Well, the, the medics have diverse backgrounds, but most of the medics in the current, in the first year group, were ex-Green Berets, as was Medics Carher. Most of the fellows had had independent duty in Vietnam. He did not. Uh, he had independent duty within the United States. That is to say, he would go out on bivouacs with the troops and be responsible for whatever he could handle that occurred while they were away. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, they then received three months of formal training at the university and then nine months of preceptorship, making a total of one year, where they're under the tutelage of just one physician. Must they uh, function only in hospitals or in extended care facilities, or can they work elsewhere? Well, I think that the nice thing, the medics was evolved as a general practice or family practice concept. And I think that the way that they're used depends a lot on the man that they're, that they're practicing with, because there's a lot of difference between my kind of practice and a small town doctor in eastern Washington, say. You think medics should be called assistant doctors? No, I think medics should be called medics. Uh, they should be seen as doctors, helpers, another kind of health care personnel. Health care delivery today has gone beyond doctor and hospital to include other kinds of medical personnel and other locations for medical care. Frequently, the best and cheapest place for treatment of a patient is in his own home, and it makes no difference if home is in a ghetto, a wealthy residential neighborhood, or a rural area. Working under the home health program of the Tennessee Department of Health, Nurse Reba Price and a speech therapist are making one of their regular visits to the home of James Robinson. His partial paralysis and speech impairment are the results of a stroke. Jimmy Robinson is a good example of a patient that really home care is the thing that he needs. He's with his family, he's with people who love him, he's with, he gets the support that they can give him. He's far better off being in the home with home care than he is in the hospital. The thing that uh, many people do not realize, that even though the patient is on home care, he's under medical supervision, the physician is still in attendance of the patient, and he has professional nursing supervised by the, by the public health nurse. And we'll move in. Well, you're doing well with those exercises. Bacon, say bacon. 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 things happening out there after all. But it isn't organized. It isn't systematized. It needs a plan, something to tie it all together. Well, there's one thing that ties it together right now. Like what? People. People who care enough to try to change things. People are starting to get involved all over the country. And when that happens, things are bound to change. In Nashville, community concern about health care is transformed into direct community action. Using a time-honored fundraising device, Tennessee workers hold a dance for health. Their goal? A prepaid group health plan for their city. Several trade unions have joined forces with the area's comprehensive health planning agency. Now, Tom, uh, we were talking about consumer participation. Just exactly what form did that take here? The consumers have organized and chartered in the state of Tennessee the Tennessee Group Health Foundation, a nonprofit, consumer-oriented organization 
which is now community. It has management, labor, and community at large people. It has representation from the economic groups. It has representation from providers. It has representation fundamentally, however, that will assure that the consumer is continuing in the decision-making process of how medical care can be and will be delivered for the purpose of keeping people healthy. It's very true. We work very closely uh, with uh, Tom and his group on the prepaid plan, uh, providing statistical data and other information. Our council has supported it, not only by in paper and in writing, but we've supported it physically and every other way we can. We believe it. We believe that the people need a choice. And uh, if you don't think so, just ask some of them tonight. What happens when you get the bill? Sometimes you sit down and think about how you're going to pay it if you don't have hospitalization or, you know. It's a wonderful plan, program for the people that really need it and have a bunch of kids. I feel that this is one way if we can get a prepaid health program in, that this will benefit everyone. So this way we can budget our money. We know how much we have to spend for medical care, and it's not a haphazard thing. We've got to change the health delivery system in this nation to where we compensate doctors for keeping people well. Hey, where you going? Out. But not the way I came in. This time, I'm going to do more than just complain. Well, we are getting there, and we'll need his help to make it work. Along with the private medical sector. And the government. Still, people will need help to pay for it. Like a family health insurance plan for the poor. And more help for the middle class. They're hurting, too. Don't I know it. Imagine, Americans spend $70 billion a year on health care. It could buy a lot more care if we can get this thing working. Indeed, but things are changing. It would seem to me they could change even faster. Why not? Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> 